Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I am really excited to talk to you about this company today because this company is a dividend king. In order to qualify as a dividend king, a company must pay a dividend for at least 50 consecutive years. Well, this company not has only paid a dividend for over 50 years, it has been paying a dividend for, get this, 146 years, which is just unbelievable. In fact, 54 years, they've increased the dividend. Currently, they're paying over a 3% dividend yield, and the stock has fallen almost 50% since the beginning of the year. Recently, they announced a new CEO who has come in and implemented or starting to implement a cost-cutting strategy of $2 billion, which is very, very significant. This company has numerous iconic brands and are a leader in their industry, and they're trading at a very attractive valuation today. So we're going to talk about this company. Hope you get some value out of it. If you do, smash that thumbs up button. Before we dig into the company, if this is the first time you watched a video of mine, my name is Justin Linderink. I'm an accountant by day. I've been an accountant for almost 20 years now, so I try to use my accounting and finance background and my stock analysis and hopefully bring you guys value through that. So let's just jump right into this. Uh, that is it over the last 10 years, where on contrast, S&P 500 has been up almost 200% over the last 10 years. And again, they've only, stock is only up about 46%. So definitely has lagged S&P 500 by quite a bit over the last 10 years. Now that does not mean this is a terrible stock or a terrible company to get into. It's just important to do your research and determine what the company is gonna be doing going forward. All right, so next up, let's talk about business. You know, what is this company all about? And they were founded in 1843 by Frederick Stanley. They used to be called the Stanley Works. In March 2010, the company merged with Black & Decker. That's why they're called Stanley Black & Decker. The company's operations are classified into two reportable business segments, tools and storage and industrial. The company has one non-reportable business operating segment, uh, mechanical access solutions, but that's a very, very small part of their revenue. So the tools and storage segment is the biggest part of their business, which is comprised of power tools, hand tools, accessories, and storage, and outdoor power equipment. Annual revenues in the tool and storage segments were $12.8 billion in 2021, representing 82%, so eight-tenths of this company's revenue come from tools and storage. The other big part of their business is the industrial segment, which is comprised of engineered fastening infrastructure businesses. Annual revenues in the industrial segment were $2.5 billion in 2021, representing 16% of the company's total revenue. So the brands that Stanley Black & Decker holds are very recognizable. Obviously, Stanley, I think, is a great brand. Uh, DeWalt is one of my favorite brands out there. Obviously, Black & Decker is a big one. They bought Craftsman uh, a couple of years ago. They own Bostitch, which is another popular one. You also have Porter & Cable, which most people would recognize. Uh, Troy Built is another one people recognize. Uh, Cub Cadet and also Hustler. Those are certainly the ones right off the top of my head that I recognize. So super investors, do super investors own the stock? And they do, there's, there's four of them. So Greenhaven Associates, Aerial Appreciation Fund, Aerial Focus Fund, and Olstein Capital Management. For me, it's extremely important to look at other people, super investors, large hedge fund managers, 
if they're buying the stock, it could be an indication that it is of good value. I would be concerned, especially a company the size of Stanley Black & Decker, which is around a $15 billion market cap, or I think may, might be closer actually to $20 billion market cap now, that if you no know, super investors are invested in it, that would concern me that maybe it's not a an attractive buy, but there are four ones out there. Now, insiders have been buying, there's one. So there was a director who bought about $1.4 million worth of shares in August. So just a couple of weeks ago. So that's a good sign. Insiders are buying and then also super investors have bought the stock. Now, what's important to know, looking at a company, do they have a moat? Do they have a competitive advantage over their competitors? And the biggest moat I can think of for Stanley Black & Decker is their brands, all their branded tools that they have, right? So the company's mode is ingrained in their brands. The company owns multiple leading brands in their categories, such as Stanley, DeWalt, Troy Bilt, Craftsman, Black & Decker, Hustler, Turf, Cub Cadet, Bostitch, and Porter Cable. So that is certainly their uh, biggest moat that they have. Now, let's talk about historical numbers. So I like to go back and look at the last 10 years and kind of see where the company is trended. Now, it's much more important to know where the company is going in the future, but it's also kind of good to see where they've been in the past. I look at what I call the big eight numbers, which is sales per share, earnings per share, free cash flow per share, book value per share, return on invested capital, net debt payoff, and EV over EBIT or operating multiple. And lastly, the operating margin or EBIT margin. So that's what we're going to do right now. So, all right. So the big five numbers here in the middle, and then I kind of call the, all these the big eight. So sales per share, if you look down here, it's about a 5% growth per year. Earnings per share is seven. Uh, uh, cash from operations is negative 4%, which we'll talk about more here in a second. Book, book value per share is 6%. Return on invested capital is 8%. So, you know, when I'm looking at this, you know, a great company, I would say, would be at 10% or higher. I'm looking at 10% or higher. If they're in, you know, 15%, they're doing really good. Over 20% is just absolutely uh, phenomenal. Uh, this did concern me when I looked into it is the negative 4%. And it's really because 2021 really took a big hit. And the big reason for that is they brought in a ton of inventory during uh, the, the year. So at the end of the year, they brought in, it was like $1.9 billion of inventory, somewhere around there. And that's what's really decreasing the cash flow and, and the cash from operations specifically. So that's why it, it fell. It wasn't necessarily that the business is doing really, really poorly. They're certainly trying to do better. And I did think that 2021 was not as good as some previous years, but the main reason this dipped in 2021 was because of the inventory purchase that they did. Now, ROIC of 8% is okay. It's not great. I'd rather see it 10% or higher. A uh, net debt payoff. So I'm make, looking at total net debt, which is total debt, the company uh, subtracting out cash, and then looking at operating income. How many years is it going to take the company to pay off operating income, or how much, how long is it going to take for them to pay off their total net debt uh, based on their operating income? It's about two and a half years on average. Now, as of the end of last year, it's 3.4. I like to see under three, so they're kind of right around there, um, but it has gone up. That's another negative thing in 2021. So I want to see them start paying that down. They said they are going to start trying to deleverage overall. Now, as far as an average multiple for the company, it's been around 16. And the multiple I look at is enterprise value over EBIT. And then their margins, these are operating margins on average, they've been around 12%, but the last two years they've been at 14 and 13. So the last two years actually have been better as far as an operating in, uh, margin side of things. All right. So now let's talk about valuation for this company. And there's different ways I value companies. Sometimes I look at, you know, 10 cap valuation. Sometimes I, I do it for, you know, a discounted free cash flow model. This particular one, I'm going to do an operating, operating earnings discounted model. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I think the company is going to grow on a sales, uh, Kager basis on a per year basis of around 4% over the next 10 years. I mean, the company actually has come out and said that they believe, or management believes that they can grow organically around six to 7% per year. And then with some more acquisitions in the MAA, M and A activity, uh, that they could get up higher than that, even all the way up to, to 10%. But I'm being conservative, I'm gonna say 4% 
over the next 10 years for sales. And then as far as operating income, I think it's going to dip over the next two or three years around 9 to 12 percent. But I think they're going to average out around 13 percent, which has been historically where they've been at. So that is essentially a 9% increase in operating income during that standpoint. With a multiple of 16, I come with an intrinsic value of $127 for this company, which is a 22% margin of safety. Now, uh, I also did a 10 cap valuation, which I, I'm not going to show in here, but I came with around a $93. Uh, so we're trading at you know, the stock around $98 right now still looks fairly attractive looking at different valuation uh, models overall. And if you're curious on knowing how to do this, I do have a Patreon as well. If you join that, you'll get access to my valuation templates. I have about uh, four of them that are out there, and I teach you how to use my valuation templates and even my stock analysis workbook that I have as well. And you get access to my Discord channel uh, too. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a link down in the description and you can go check it out from there. I'd love to see you over there. All right. So now let's talk about risks associated with the company. Cause whenever I'm looking at a company, I want to know not only what's good, but what's what could potentially go wrong or what are the risks going into this? So one is they have a brand new CEO. The CEO has been there since the late 1990s. He's been moving up through the company. And so there definitely is a, a devil's advocate saying, you know, maybe the company doesn't want to hire outside. They're just ingrained in their process. They don't want to bring some new pair of eyes into the company, which could be a negative. So, so something to be or something to consider, but he did put together a cost cutting plan of $2 billion and went through the plan. Looks pretty interesting. He obviously knows the company really well. He's been there for over uh, two decades, but will it work? That That is the question, right? Uh, since the company primarily derives its revenues from tools, right? Power tools, you know, they're dependent on economic prosperity. So if we are in a recession or a bear market, that could hurt this company. We could see sales fall. Um, and that's kind of where I've kind of, you know, kind of taken back a little bit of sales and operating margins over the next couple of years, uh, assuming that might be the case, but it does create volatility in the stock price. So it's just something to, to be aware of there. Uh, the company has been taking on a lot of debt. That's also something to be very, very cautious about. I still think they're an okay uh, as far as their operating income versus their total debt as of this standpoint, but it has grown. It's grown up to about $11.5 billion. It's gone from $4.7 billion in 2020 to $11.5 billion in 2022. The company is talking about deleveraging, which they need to do. That is extremely, extremely important going forward, in my personal opinion. But if they keep taking on debt, that is more red flags, in my opinion. Uh, the company has been very active on the M&A front. So that is mergers and acquisitions. They've been buying a lot of companies from you know Black & Decker in 2010 to recently Craftsman. Also, Excel is another one that they bought. So they want to grow organically around 6-7%, but they want to grow on the mergers and acquisition front so they can get the revenue up to around the 10% per year range. Uh, they're being devil's advocate again. Are they buying, you know, basically companies that have the same tools anyway, right? Craftsman's going to have a lot of the same tools, or, but they're buying that brand. The brand has a good, you know, history. People like them, uh, but devil's advocate with that too. Stanley and Black & Decker came out when they bought the company and said, hey, we're going to make tools, you know, back in the United States, but they haven't done that. They've been making them overseas still. So there's a lot going on there. Can they effectively integrate these companies into their business, right? Uh, without spending a ton of money, really being very efficient. And are they just saturating their own brand because they're just buying brands that have the same thing? So that's all something to uh, think about uh, there as well. So overall, what do I think about Stanley, Black & Decker? I think they have fantastic brands. DeWalt brand specifically is my go-to brand. Absolutely love it. They have other great brands from you know, Stanley, Bostitch, uh, Porter & Cable, and a lot of other great ones that are out there. Uh, their stock is, is undervalued, in my personal opinion, while being conservative on projection for sales and, and operating margins going out into the future. Uh, they're a dividend king. I mean, this company's been paying dividends for 146 years. You know, typically when I buy into a company, I don't care if they're paying a dividend or not because it could stop. You know, if their free cash flow is not good enough, they could stop it at any time. Um, but it is good 
it is worth noting that this company has been paying a dividend for 146 years. All right. Uh, they're under new management. So it, it's, it's important to, you know, see if there's going to be a dip in free cash flow coming up. Um, you know, this year and going into next year may be very hard to predict with the new CEO going into recession. Again, this, this stock is very cyclical based on economic prosperity. Uh, you know, as far as an, you know, you know, economics and the market going right now, it doesn't look great. So it could hurt the stock. It's another reason why the stock has fallen this year um, as well. Plus the, the debt that they've, they've brought on. Now, if management can execute the $2 billion cost cut and they can grow revenue to 12, 10 to 12% range, like they've been talking about, you know, this, Stock right now looks like a steal at $98, $99. It looks like a complete steal. Um, but that's only if management can execute. That's that's what's really important there. All right, so those are my thoughts on Stanley Black & Decker, ticker symbol SWK. I would like to know, do you own this stock? What do you think about this stock? Is this something that you would be interested in? What about them paying dividends for 146 years? Absolutely in Incredible. And again, I do have a Patreon if you're wondering how to value companies. I do offer valuation templates on there and how to use my stock analysis workbook as well. And you do get access to my Discord channel too. So if you want to go check that out, again, link down below. Love to see you over there if you're interested in something like that. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll catch you on the other side. Take care and God bless.